the Gospel of Matthew. I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to focus in on verse 5, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Every Sunday now we are gathering together with Jesus on that plain area just below the mountain top there on the high place overlooking the beautiful waters of the Sea of Galilee and we are listening in as he preaches the most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. We are specifically listening to him as he initiates this sermon with what are called the Beatitudes. We have already looked at the first two of those Beatitudes this morning. We are coming to number 3, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Follow along with me in your Bible as we read. Again, we will begin in verse 1 and read through verse 5 this morning to get the context of uh, what Jesus is saying. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the humble, the meek, for they will inherit the earth. As I'm listening to Jesus speak those words, and you with me today... I look down on the front of the crowd listening to him speak, and there on the front is a young man with a stunned look on his face, stunned silence, his eyes are wide open, his mouth is agape. He cannot believe what he just heard Jesus say, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I see those on the fourth row back behind where Jesus is speaking. And I see the smirk on their face as they hear Jesus say, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Somewhere toward the back of the crowd, I heard the guy who murmured, yeah, right, Uh uh-huh. We know how that works, you bet. The meek inherit the earth, you've gotta be kidding me. They're the ones who are ground into the earth. They don't inherit it. Oh yeah, the meek may get to heaven, but we know who actually owns and gets the earth. It's the arrogant. It's the aggressive, it's the mafia, it's the porno king, it's the drug lords, it's the dictator. Those are the people who get what they want. They're the ones who get everything. Obviously, Jesus never heard of the great manager in baseball, Leo DeRocher, who said to Mel Lott in the 1940s New York Giants, nice guys finish last. Jesus obviously never heard of that. How many business moguls, how many company CEOs have on their wall or over their desk this beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The atheistic philosopher Nietzsche read this parable or read this beatitude, and then he said, let me paraphrase that the way it should be. And Nietzsche wrote, assert yourself, it is the arrogant who take over the earth. What in the world is Jesus talking about when he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Take any English dictionary and look up the word meek. Early on in the definitions, you're going to read this definition, deficient in courage. Who is the meek person? Well, that's the man, that's the woman who is deficient in courage. Other words that can be used to, as synonyms, at least in our understanding of the English word meek, we associate meekness with weakness, cowardice, timidity, lack of conviction, harmless, insipid, a milquetoast, Casper milquetoast kind of person, a doormat. That's who we associate as the one who is meek. But now we need to go back a little bit further from our English dictionary. Let's go back to the Greek dictionary for a moment. Let's go back to Aristotle, who produced one of the first and great books on ethics. And in his book on ethics, and as was used among the Greeks 
about 300 or so years before Jesus' day and down and inclusive of his day. This word in your English Bible, meek, is the Greek word praus, praus. And it is a word in Greek that does not mean what it has come to mean in English. It doesn't mean weak. It doesn't mean cowardice. It doesn't mean someone who is timid, a milk toast, a doormat, someone who is insipid or harmless or who lacks conviction. No, the word in Greek and was used in the first century in the days of Jesus is a word that literally means that character that has the balance between excessive anger and no anger at all. It is a word that describes the life of strength and balance. It was a word in the first century that was used to describe people who when they were angry, they were angry for the right reasons. They were angry at the right person in the right manner for the right amount of time and in the right moment. That's the meaning of this word. It is a word that describes a gentleness when you have the power to act severely. Long way away, huh, from our English word meekness and what we generally think about it. The word in Greek that you have in your New Testament when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, it is a word that describes a gentleness when you have power. It's a word that combines strength and gentleness together. It's interesting how this word was used in the first century. It was used to describe, for example, a soothing medicine when you are sick. It has the power to bring about health. It was a word that was used to describe a gentle breeze, not a tornado, not a hurricane, not a destructive wind, but rather a meek wind, a wind that is cooling, a wind that is gentle. And it was a word that was used predominantly to describe a domesticated horse. Here's the wild stallion running free out on the prairie. But then that horse is taken, and that horse is domesticated and tamed, and now that horse has power under control. And that is the key to the meaning of the word that you find in your Bible right here in verse 5. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who know what it is to have power under control. Some of you might be familiar with the Christian author uh, Philip Keller. He grew up as a child in Kenya and his father owned uh, ranches there and was involved, had lots of oxen always on his property and was involved regularly in the, in the domesticating of wild oxen. And he said as a boy, I used to love to sit there and it got so crazy, I'd get up on a tree limb to kind of watch what was going on. But he said, you would see those oxen and they would be brought in and they were wild and they were angry and they were ferocious and my dad would take the yoke and he would begin to put the yoke on the oxen in order to train them and to domesticate them. And he talked about how those oxen would do everything under the sun. They would be ferocious. They would snort. They would paw the ground. They would roll in the dust. They would make all kinds of commotion and trouble. But finally, over time, as they became used, used to the to that piece of wood called a yoke that they would be harnessed in in order to accomplish great things. And so here is that powerful animal that is now domesticated and harnessed and able to do useful, productive work. That's the meaning of the word meek when Jesus said, blessed are the meek. In Greek and in the New Testament, this word is used many, many times. And it is a word that describes a perfect trust in God and a perfect willingness to obey God. 
It's the picture of the Christian who is harnessed up with God, ready to do useful work. It's a word that describes someone who is never bitter. It's a word that is used to describe someone who is never resentful. It is a humble and gentle attitude toward others, which is determined by a true estimate of self. Listen to that again. What does it mean to be meek? How would you be described if you can be described that way? Here is what it means. You have a humble and a gentle attitude toward God and toward others, which is determined by a true estimate of yourself. To be meek is my response to who I am before God. It has nothing to do with weakness. It has nothing to do with timidity. It has nothing to do with cowardice. It is power, strength under control. It is my response to who I am before God. Now, there are two great personal illustrations of meekness in Scripture. There's one in the Old Testament and there's one in the New Testament. I want to talk briefly about them. When Jesus said, blessed are the meek, we see that exhibited in the Old Testament in the life of Moses. In fact, you find it in Numbers chapter 12. Now, you don't need to turn. You may want to just follow along with me. You may want to look at this a little bit later. But you remember Moses is God's great leader of the people of Israel, of the Jewish people out of Egypt and into the promised land. And interestingly enough, Moses, the great man of God and great leader, is described as being meek. Now look at it. In Numbers chapter 12, here, here's the backstory. Miriam and Aaron, now that is Moses' sister and brother, right? Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because of the Cushite woman he had married. For, it says, he had married a Cushite woman. They said, does the Lord speak only through Moses? Does he not also speak through us? And the Lord heard it. Now look at verse 3. Moses was a very meek man. A very meek man, more so than anyone on the face of the earth. Now, before we go on in Numbers 12 and see what happens here, what's going on? What's gotten into you, Miriam? What in the world are you fussing about? Well, Moses' first wife, Zipporah, whom he married when he fled Egypt as a young man, and he went down to Midian, and he married the daughter of a Midianite priest. Her name was Zipporah. Her, that by, her name, by the way, means one who sings like a bird. And so he married her, but over time, uh, somewhere along the way, she died. And now, by the time we get to this point in the Exodus account and this point in the book of Numbers, Moses has married someone else. He has married a girl from Sudan, modern Sudan, south of Egypt in those days, what you and I would know as modern Sudan. So here is Moses, a Semite who is brown-skinned, and he has married a girl from Sudan who is black. And Aaron and Miriam think that this ethni ethnic diversity is going to create problems for the purity of the race of the Semites and the Jewish people. And so Miriam and Aaron, his own sister and brother, criticize him because he married a person of color from their perspective. He married a black woman. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. Verse 4, Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, You three come out to the tent of meeting. Now, by the way, in the Old Testament, when God says that, oh my, things are not going to look good. Things are not good. When God said, hey, the three of you come meet with me, you know, that's the principal's office. So the three of them went out. Verse 5, the Lord descended in a pillar of cloud, stood at the entrance of the tent, summoned Aaron and Miriam. Oh boy, got Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now the Lord says, Aaron and Miriam, step forward, please. When the two of them came forward, he said, listen to what I say. 
If there is a prophet among you from the Lord, I make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He's faithful in all of my household. I speak to him directly, openly, not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The Lord's anger burned against them, and he left. So they got a lecture from God. And then God leaves. Verse 10. As the cloud moved away from the tent, Miriam's skin suddenly became diseased, resembling snow. When Aaron turned toward her, he saw that she was diseased. And he, he said to Moses, My Lord, please don't hold against us this sin we have so foolishly committed. Please don't let her be like a dead baby whose flesh is half eaten away. When it comes out of his mother's womb, Moses then cried out to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her. And the Lord answered Moses, and he healed Miriam. Now, here's the point of all of this. Miriam had a little bit of racial prejudice in her. And so, essentially, what God said is, okay, Miriam, all right, you're brown skin. You know, Moses has married a woman who is black from Sudan, and so we'll just take care of that. We'll just turn your skin white. You want to be white? You think white's better? Okay, fine. We'll let you have a little leprosy for a while. And so her skin becomes white. Now, there are many lessons here that go along with that element, but that's not what we're here to preach on. That's just the backstory. You need to understand the backstory. And my, that, by the way, by the way, might give you some idea of God's view of racial prejudice. By the way, that would solve it, wouldn't it? That would eliminate racial prejudice if God just said, hey, everybody who's going to act out, think, speak, in a racially prejudiced way, that's fine. If they're going to look at other people's skin color and be prejudiced, I'll fix that. I'll just turn their skin. They'll give them a little leprosy. I'll give them a skin disease. That would end, that would end racism right there, wouldn't it? By the way, I got a lot of ideas for God that would solve stuff. I told him about this one one time some, some years ago in prayer. I know how to fix gossip in the church. I told God, I said, Lord, if you'll just do this, this will eliminate all gossip in all of your churches. If every woman, let's start with women. We know men can gossip too, but let's start with women. If every woman who gossips immediately, as soon as they gossip, immediately, if they were to gain five pounds every time they gossip, <laughs> that would solve it. You wouldn't gossip, but two or three times about 15 extra pounds, and that would cut that off pretty quick. Listen, I got all kind of ways to fix stuff if God would just do it, do it my way. He doesn't always do it my way. But God said to Miriam, okay, young lady, you want to be prejudiced? You think white's right? Okay, fine. We'll let you experience that a little bit with a change in your skin, and you just have a little skin disease yourself. But now here's the point of it all. Here is Moses, the God-called leader. And his own sister and brother, along with others who constantly grumbled and griped and complained and criticized Moses among the people of Israel. You know that story. And yet, in all of that, Moses does not retaliate. He doesn't uh, get angry, get resentful, and become bitter. And try to fix all of that. No, we're told in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, Moses was a very meek. He was a humble, a meek man, more so than anyone on the face of the earth. He let God handle it. He had the power. He had the authority. He was God's man. Hey, this is the guy who stood up to Pharaoh. Does that sound weak to you? This is the guy, and the plagues came. Now, he was just the intermediary. God did all of that. But this is the guy who won the freedom of the people of Israel out of Egypt. Does he sound weak to you? No. Not at all. But the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the illustration of meekness is Moses, one of the great leaders, yet he was meek. Now, the illustration in the New Testament is Jesus himself. Jesus himself. In Matthew 21 and verse 5, Jesus is making his entrance into the city of Jerusalem. 
And he comes in riding on a donkey. And what does Matthew say about him in the description? And what does Jesus say? He talks about how he comes to Jerusalem meek and riding on a donkey. Our Lord himself. Folks, that's the king riding in. And yet the king is coming in and Jesus himself is what? He's described as being meek. But I love Matthew chapter 11 where we get another taste of who Jesus is and what he's all about and how we are to emulate him. Because in Matthew chapter 11, a very familiar passage in verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all of you who are weary and are heavy laden. You're burdened. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls. You see, the perfect example, the perfect illustration in Jesus' sermon for meekness is himself. He himself is meek, but yet he is strong. He is the king. He has all power, power to rule the nations, power to rule the sea, power to rule all of nature. He's not weak, but he is meek. He is the example of what it means. Blessed are the meek. <laughs> they will inherit the earth. So we've talked about the definition of meekness. We've talked about the illustration of meekness. Now I want to spend the rest of our time, let's talk about the application of meekness to our lives. And we're going to look at a lot of passages. It's going to be a little quick. This is not my normal way of doing things. But this is a very short text. But we need to look at how many times this particular word is applied. And the first place we want to look and the first thing we want to say is this that meekness is that attitude and character that you and I should have toward God first and then toward other people. God first and then other people. Now, the God first is found in Psalm 37. So listen to this Psalm, Psalm 37. I'm just going to read it and then we're going to move on. But I want you to understand God's definition of meekness from Psalm 37. Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong. They will wither quickly like grass, wilt like tender green plants. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord. Wait expectantly for Him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the person who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger. Give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm, for evildoers will be destroyed. But those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Look at that. That's the place where Jesus gets that inherit the earth, inherit the land. It comes from this Psalm, Psalm 37. Look at verse 10. A little while and the wicked person will be no more. Though you look for him, he will not be there. But the meek will inherit the land. Psalm 37, 11. This is the only beatitude that our Lord directly quotes the Old Testament. It's a direct quote. Other allusions are in some of the other beatitudes. This is a direct quote. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament Psalm, Psalm 37. The meek, the humble, the meek will inherit the land and will enjoy abundant prosperity. So, think about those words that we just read. Who then are the meek? According to Psalm 37, who are the meek? They are those who trust in the Lord. They are those who delight in the Lord. They are those who commit their way to the Lord. They are those who rest in the Lord. They are those who submit to the Lord and to the will of God for their lives. They are those who adjust their lives to the Word of God. They, there is a certain flexibleness a certain flexibleness to God's Word. The meek are people who don't quarrel with the instructions from God, but they quarrel with the corruptions of their own heart. 
One of the ways you can tell whether you're meek by the biblical definition is do you argue and fuss about what God's Word says is how you ought to live? Do you fuss and argue with the instructions of God in His Word? Or do you rather grieve over the corruptions of your own heart to which this Word of God speaks? Ah, oh, that might help us to determine who are the meek ones around and who are not. Meekness begins with an understanding of who you are before God. You're the person who trusts Him, who honors Him, who depends upon Him, who waits on Him, who delights in Him. This is the person who is meek according to Psalm 37. But then the Scripture describes meekness toward everyone else, in your relationships with everyone else. The truly meek person has that mysterious ingredient in their life that baffles everybody else. The truly meek person is baffling to everybody else. They don't expect you to live this way. They don't expect you. The world doesn't expect you to think this way. You are an anomaly. You are a mystery. You are a bafflement to other people. So that in terms of humanity, in relationship to all people, the people who are meek are the people who are only angry at the right time and for the right reasons, and they're never angry at the wrong time and for the wrong reasons. Is that true of you? Is that true of you when you're in school? Is that true of you when you're at work? Is that true of you when you're in your home? Is that true of you when you're in your church? You're only angry at the right time, and you're only angry at the right people, never the wrong time. Paul speaks about it in Ephesians 4, and verse 26, the meekness that we are to have. In fact, the, uh, the Bible describes the meek person as the person who is, who is never right to be angry over personal insult. There is no time when you have a right to be angry over personal insults. If you are, you're not a meek person. You say, well, uh, well uh, David, that, yeah, I don't like that. Well, that's what Jesus says. That's what the Scripture says. Selfish anger is always sinful. Selfless anger is good. There's time to be angry. There are things to be angry about and people to be angry with, but it cannot be associated with anything selfish. All selfish anger is sinful. All selfless anger is the only kind of right anger we are allowed to have biblically. Jesus became angry, but it was selfless. It was not a selfish kind of an anger. He never became angry at the things people did to him. But when he saw his father's house being desecrated, oh, did he weave that whip and he went through that temple and he drove out those money changers and you saw the righteous anger, the kind of anger that comes from meekness that came from the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word means gentleness. It's a soft behavior, a loving behavior. Behavior. It's the opposite of all rudeness. It's a balanced and well-behaved life. The meek person is God's gentleman. The meek person is God's gentlewoman. Blessed are the meek, Jesus said. Blessed are the meek. The meek are people who bear those insults and those injuries. According to Scripture, I'm just running through these quickly, the meek are people who are opposed to hastiness. They are opposed to malice. They don't allow malice to rule in their life. You know what malice is? It's mental murder. I wish I could just kill her. I wish I could kill him. Malice is mental murder. Meekness is opposed to all malice. It's opposed to all revenge. Meekness never takes revenge. Meekness is opposed to evil speaking. You're not going to run them down. Meekness forgives injuries. 
it, it, it's real. It's a real, a genuine forgive. Not a, not a, well, I forgive you, but then you don't ever speak to them again. Not an I forgive you, but you talk all about them badly to everybody else for the next five years. No. No, it's real. Number two, it's full and complete. Number three, it is often because there are many times we need to ask forgiveness for God for failure to be meek in our lives. It's a forgiving of an injury. But it's even more. The Scripture says meekness is doing good for evil. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, this very same principle. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, hey, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Do you love your enemies? That's how you can tell whether you're meek or not today. Do you love your enemies? Do you seek to do good to those who hate you? Romans 12, 20, the same kind of thing. Paul talks about it. The importance of meekness in our lives. The sunlight of Scripture shines brighter than the flashlight of human reason at this point. You say, well, David, that's just not reasonable. I don't know. That's logically, I can't figure that out. Whoa, whoa, you know, whoa. It's the sunlight of Scripture always shines brighter than the flashlight of your reason. This is what it means, according to Scripture, to be one who is meek. Now, there are many places in Scripture where you can test your meekness, the attitude of meekness that you should have, for example, 2 Timothy 2.25 tells you about how to relate to people in times of disagreement. You're to be gentle to everyone. It tells you in Matthew 2.24 and 25, meekness in teaching. Those of you who are teachers, those of us who are preachers, we are told there that we are to be able to teach with all meekness teaching people. And then we are to be meek in being taught. James 1.21 says, Those of you who are being taught the Word of God, right now, this moment, you are to receive, according to James 1.21, receive the Word of God with all meekness. It's the proper attitude of the reception of the Word of God. You don't mentally and spiritually, when God is speaking through His Word, you don't mentally and spiritually sit there like this with your arms folded. No. It's a way of being taught. Meekness is the attitude we should have in reproving other believers who do wrong. Galatians 6, 1, hey, you that are spiritual, restore the brother or sister in the church who is sinning, but being careful how you do it, doing it with all, and the word is the word here in Jesus' beatitude, with all meekness. Restore with a gentle spirit, a meek spirit. Don't pin them to the wall by their collar and slap them upside the head and tell them what they're doing wrong. Everything in you may want to do that. But you're not being me when you do that. There's the right way and there's the wrong way, the right manner. Meekness in reproof. There's a certain meekness to be exhibited in church division. Ephesians 4, 1, 2, and 3, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the church, in the bond of peace, and Paul says, do it with meekness. This is how you deal with division in the church. Meekness goes in marriage. In 1 Peter 3, in verse 4, Peter gives some instructions to wives, and then he gives some instructions to husbands. And in his instructions to wives... He says, ladies, don't make your life all about your external beauty. Now, there's nothing wrong with external beauty, nor does Peter criticize external beauty, but he just says, if all you're about is external beauty and you don't cultivate the beauty of an inward spirit, which is, he uses this very term that Jesus uses, meekness, a meek and gentle spirit. And of course, husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church with that same kind of strength under control. There's a sense of application to men as well. It, this is applied in marriage. It's applied in being a witness and soul winning, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks you, why are you a Christian? But to do it with meekness and gentleness. Don't take a family Bible to that person at your office who's lost and take a big family Bible and whop them on the head and let them know, you're going to hell. Now, they are going to hell without Christ, but have a little wisdom and a little meekness in how you tell them about Christ. 
These are some of the biblical ways, the attitudes and actions that are to be exhibited in the life of those of us who are Christians. This is how we apply what Jesus said. Blessed are the meek is a direct statement by Jesus, but underlying that statement is an imperative. Underlying all of these beatitudinal statements are imperatives. Jesus is saying to you, hey, be a meek person. You you men, you need to be, be meek. Women, you need to be meek. Students, you need to be meek. You need to practice meekness in your relationship first to God and then to everyone else. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. You say, well, David, how do I cultivate true meekness? It is a spiritual fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5.23, of the nine fruits of the Spirit that are mentioned there. This is one of them. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Paul in Galatians 5 said, here are the nine fruits of the Spirit, and guess what? One of them is meekness. Ask God, the Holy Spirit, to cultivate in your heart an attitude, a mindset, and then a lifestyle of meekness. Not getting your way, not griping, complaining, arguing, me first. The world owes me something. No, all of that's the opposite of meekness. Cultivating meekness is a summons to active living. It's a dedication to living out meekness and gentleness in our world. Our deeds are determined not by anger, not by brutality, but by goodness and by meekness. This is how the Christian act. You say, well, David, that's not how the others act. That's true. Unbelievers aren't going to act this way. They don't know how. They're they're sinful at the core. They don't know Christ. You do. Therefore, you're changed. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You're in the kingdom. That's the point of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know the king. You're in the kingdom. And because you know the king and because you're in the kingdom, here's how people in his kingdom live. You say, well, David, they don't live that way. That doesn't matter. This is how the king's children live. But over there, they don't, it doesn't matter. This is how we live. It's not how the world lives. This is how we live, cultivating that meekness. It is a fruit of the Spirit. Finally, listen to what Jesus said. Blessed, fruitful, flourishing. Remember our first sermon, that word blessed connotes not, not just uh, I feel good or not just God says you're okay, but it's a concept of flourishing. In your life, you're growing, you're spiritually sturdy, nourished, flourishing are the meek. Why? They shall inherit the earth. Well, hot dog, David, I'd love to own all those oil wells and blocks of downtown Manhattan and some of the French Riviera and part of King's Ranch over there in West Texas. That's not what he's talking about. Now, that may be true for some people, some Christians, But it's not a promise of oil wells, blocks of downtown Manhattan owning the French Riviera or the biggest ranch in Texas. No, nor is it talking about those in Jesus' day who wanted the Lord to immediately bring in his kingdom physically so that militarily they destroyed Rome. We're going to throw off the yoke of Roman bondage. And there were those who wanted to do it militarily. Others wanted it politically. And Jesus repudiates both ways. We're not going to do this militarily. We're not going to do it politically. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the land. There's coming a time, Jesus is basically saying, when look, the king is here, then the king is going to go away. He's going to die. He's going to rise again and go away. But one day the king is coming back and he's going to rule all of the land and you're going to rule with him. And so between now and then, whatever's the king's is yours. And in that sense, that's how and why it is true that you inherit the earth. The return of Christ is going to make that a reality, but it is already a reality. You can see it in the animal kingdom. Step up and place your bets. Who's going to rule, the lions or the lambs? Step up, place your bets today. Who's going to rule? Will it be the eagle or the sparrow? Well, interestingly enough, it's the lions and the eagles who are on the endangered list. There are lambs and sparrows everywhere. They inherit the earth. Power seekers don't inherit the earth. Assyria tried it. It didn't work. Babylon tried it. It didn't work. Rome tried it. It didn't work. 
Hitler tried it, it didn't work. Before him, Napoleon tried it, it didn't work. How many have tried it throughout the ages thinking that they can inherit the earth by force, by aggression, by power, and they all failed? None of them ever inherited the earth. But the meek do. That's you and me. Those are believers. We're the ones who inherit the earth. The godless may boast, they throw their weight around. Real possession, however, eludes their grasp. They don't get it. The meek, on the other hand, although they may be deprived of this world's goods, they may be treated as disenfranchised, (laughs) but they're the ones who inherit the earth. They're the ones who, in restaurants, they don't fight over the best table. At the airline counter, they don't make a scene if they can't get a window seat or an aisle seat. Have you ever seen that? I travel a lot. I see it all the time. No, when they suffer, they don't seek revenge. They trust in God, His timing, and His justice. Those are the meek. Have you ever read 2 Corinthians 6.10? In 2 Corinthians 6.10, Paul said this, I possess nothing. I have nothing, he said, but I possess everything. That is the meek Christian who is a part of the kingdom of God. You may not have much according to the world's goods. You have nothing. Paul said, I have nothing, but yet he said, I I possess everything. Self-renunciation is the way to world domination. That's why Jesus is going to rule and reign. That's why he does rule and reign now. That's why he will rule and reign when he comes again on this earth. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians 3, verses 21 through 23? If you do, and when you do, here's what it says. Paul, writing to Christians in the churches, He said, all things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Now, I want you to listen carefully to that again. Think deeply. We're toward the end. I want you to think deeply. Listen again. Here's what Paul said. All things are yours, and you are Christ. The only thing that isn't yours is yourself. You have and possess everything in Christ. Listen to what Paul says. What does Paul say? Listen to that verse again. All things are yours. You say, I I don't feel like I have all things. Hey, all things are yours. All things are yours, and you are Christ. The only thing that isn't yours is yourself. Oh, if I could get every person in this church and every Christian everywhere to understand the spiritual meaning of all things are yours, you have everything except yourself. And the problem with so many of us, and the reason we are weak and not meek, And the reason there's division and problems and heartache and troubles and everything else in a big part, in a big way, is because we just flip that and we make it the opposite. And we make self the throne. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about me. I'm the top of the agenda. When the Bible says all things are yours, that's right, it's all yours, but except you. You're, you are Christ's. You belong to Jesus. You belong to Him. You don't belong to yourself. It's not about you. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Paul said in Romans 8, Christ is God's heir, and then he says, we who are believers are joint heirs. You know what that means? Everything that comes to Jesus comes to me. You know what? If you're an heir, guess what? You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is wait on the one who has made you an heir, and upon his death, it all becomes yours. You don't do anything to earn it or whatever. It's in the will. You're the heir. 
And because Jesus is the one who died for our sins and then rose again, the death of the one who made the will, we are joint heirs with Christ. God has said everything in the physical universe and everything in the spiritual universe is coming into the lap of Jesus, and he owns it all, and you and I are co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ. That's how we own it all. That's how we have it all. And there we are, like Paul. I have nothing, but I possess everything. The only thing that isn't mine. Paul says, all things are yours, and you are Christ. I've got everything. All things are yours, except you. Because you don't belong to you. You don't get to make the rules. God is the one who makes the rules. And therefore, he says to all of my children, I'm going to give them everything. Everything there is in the spiritual universe and in the physical universe. It comes to my son Jesus, and because they're co-heirs with Christ, I'm going to give it to them. Now listen to me as we close. Listen. Now go back and look at the order of, as we've seen the first three Beatitudes. Look at the order. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. The poor in spirit, we re re remember, is a term that describes those who recognize their personal bankruptcy before God. You never can get out of debt to God. You're desperately in need of His grace. And when you are saved, you are saved only by His grace and not because you deserved any of it. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then that leads to mourning an emotional outgrowth of being poverty-stricken spiritually. Lord, I'm nothing. Lord, I mourn over my sin. And then God said, yep, you're nothing, but I'm going to make you everything in Christ, and therefore I comfort you. And now comes out of that comes the spirit of living, the spirit of meekness, power under control. We're in the king's family. We're in the kingdom. Blessed are the, uh, the, those who are poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're related to the king. We're in the kingdom. Therefore, we live like he lived. Let me put it to you this way and illustrate it this way. First, from education. Let's take the attitudes of education. How about if we wrote them like this according to the first three Beatitudes? Blessed are those who admit they are ignorant. Theirs is learning. Blessed are those who are concerned enough to enroll in school. They shall be taught. Blessed are they who submit to the teacher. They shall inherit his knowledge and wisdom. There you have it in education. How about help? Blessed are they who face up to their illness. Theirs is help. Blessed are they who go to the doctor. They shall be helped. Blessed are they who take the doctor's prescription. They shall inherit the benefits of his knowledge. Do you see the logical progression? In this case, it is a spiritual progression. Poor in spirit, mourn, and now meekness. And we're going to see that as it continues to develop all the way through. This is what it means. When Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Another synonym for meekness is true humility. Did you know that nobody can ever come to Christ unless they come truly humble? recognizing they are sinners. Today, that's how you must come to Christ. Whether you're under my voice in this building or watching me online, whatever the case is, if you're coming to Christ, you have to come humbly. You have to come confessing your sin, and you have to come by faith. Jesus is the only way, only one who can save you. I want to invite you to do that. As we come to this time of decision-making in the service, I want to call you to make your decision for Christ today to make your decision to follow Him, to repent of your sin. By faith, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it truly means to be, be humble in spirit, poor in spirit. Then yours becomes the kingdom of heaven. And then you'll be able to live out this meekness. And then finally, to those of you who are Christians, church members first, those of you who are believers watching me here in this building online, this is the attitude and activity and character that we should be living out. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. The earth's yours. You may not have a lot of the earth right now, but it's all yours. Jesus said the day's coming when the saints are going to judge the earth. That's in the eschaton, in the end times, when Jesus comes again. He and his saints are going to be involved in the administration of what's going on on this earth during his 1,000-year reign on this earth. Let's get into practice now by living like the king lives by being truly meek in how we live. For Jesus said, blessed are the meek, 
for they shall inherit the earth. I'm going to pray to close out this portion of our service. We're going to do things a little differently today. Instead of having a quiet moment of time of public response, what we're going to do is those of you who are ready to respond, those of you online, there will be an opportunity for you to contact us. But those of you here in the building, after this service is concluded, after Dr. Biles comes with final words and a final prayer, we, some of us on the staff, we're going to be right down here at the front. I want to invite you to come and talk to us about the decision you're making. Some of you need to come to Christ. We want to talk with you and pray with you and help you. Would you come meet us down here at the front at the end of this service? Some of you are new guests today. You're here for the first time. We want to meet you. Would you come and meet us down here at the front? After Dr. Biles comes to close out our service in just a moment, whatever decision that you're making, we want to hear from you. My wife Kate will be here. I'll be here. Some of our staff are here. Dr. Biles, his wife Jay, we're all here to talk with you. So I pray with you now and let us do what God tells us to do. Father, I pray that now we would respond to your word because we know that whenever the word is preached, it demands a response. And therefore, Lord, we come to you and pray that you would speak to us and help us now to respond to you. For those who need Christ, Lord, help them to come. For those, Lord, who are making other decisions, Lord, grant that they would come at the end of this service and allow us to counsel with them and talk with them. Father, be glorified. And Lord, help us at Sunnyvale First Baptist Church to live out this beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they are the ones who inherit the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.